Hello, my name is Shane Palmer, and today I'm going to be presenting on mechanizing the military. So that means military technological advances from the year 1600 to 2000. This includes advances in firearms, tactics, mobility, communication, explosive, etc. So let's start in the 17th century, so year 1600 to 1699. So during this century, you really start to see the prevalence of gunpowder. So gunpowder really got discovered and started to be used in the 15th century as well as the 16th century, but didn't really pick up to be used in firearms and you really replace more older classic rudimentary weapons such as pikes and longbows until the 17th century. And because of these new firearms, you started to see a more fortress-based way of defending yourself because there were so many more projectiles being used. And because of gunpowder, a lot more artillery-based weapons such as cannons were being used. So you kind of saw a shift towards a strong naval force that took advantage of these new artillery firearms. And you could see boats that had as many as 120 different guns on them. Some examples of these are the galley ships that were used by Mediterranean forces, as well as new tactics that adapted to these gunpowder-fueled artillery firearms. So the line of battle tactic is taking advantage of weapons on the starboard side of a ship to line up the ships all facing the same direction to direct many, many projectiles at a single target or many targets. There will be pictures later on depicting this. And the British and the Dutch were really the people that kind of made this tactic very popular during warfare in naval fights. There were also a lot of infantry tactics, such as volley fire, that took advantage of soldiers in very systematically organized lines, and they would all fire simultaneously at a single target, follow specific commands, and the lines of these soldiers would then all point at the same target and it would help in highly urbanized areas because it could really take out a large population of energy soldier enemy soldiers at a time and you could also see use of artillery barrages where they used gunpowder fueled artillery to strike very specific areas and lands of areas like say a line of enemy soldiers are marching towards you and you use cannons to fire a line of cannonballs at the area it kind of strikes the ground and strikes the soldiers so they can no longer pass a certain line and you could, could kind of see many of these tactics being used during the 80 years war so some advances made over this hundred year period um, of course the prevalence of gunpowder in the early 1600s it shifts away from more basic short-range weapons such as pikes and pole arms and the new technology means new tactics to take advantage of so these tactics were army-wide, so a lot of armies had to change the way they were originally trained to a time for the, account for these. So moving on to a photo depicting the line of battle naval tactic. So as you can see in the picture, so this is during the Battle of Greenwich in 1801. The picture was painted in 1806 by Nicholas Pocock. So this is about 200 years after the line of battle tactic was really brought to focus, I guess, and you can see just how effective it is at kind of blowing away city walls or enemy ships or you name it, because all these ships are lined with cannons and other artillery weapons and just firing at these smaller ships. And a lot of armies took advantage of this. And here are some examples of firearms during the 17th century. So on the left you can see a pair of flintlock pistols, and on the right you can see a wheel lock rifle. So both of these kind of use the same concept of using a very large hammer that you have to manually pull back and load to strike a charge of gunpowder, which then shot out a small metal projectile, typically lead or steel. And the inside of the barrel is rifled, so the ball typically tends to travel in a straight line, but the range on them is not very good. So let's move on to the 18th century. So during the 18th century, you really started to see a rise in use of muskets. So muskets, similar to flintlock and wheellock pistols, they use gunpowder charges that project a small steel ball, or lead ball, or metal ball, 
and again it's a very long barrel sometimes as long as one to one and a half meters and it is rifled all through the barrel to help get a range of up to 300 meters um, the firing rate was very slow since you had to reload and pack it every single time you wanted to fire and it would take a very great amount of force to pack a new musket ball into the musket rifle sometimes soldiers would have to, have to use mallets and hammers to force the packing down into the rifle and this often would require many foot soldiers to have a sword or some sort of weapon on them in case they ever got into some close range combat many armies utilized these new muskets and you saw them in many different wars such as the war of spanish succession and the american revolutionary war during the 18th century also one thing you started to see during the 18th century was a shift to more uniformed and trained fighters that made up armies instead of your typical like civilian based militia group so some of the relevance of all this is there are a lot of wars fought during the 18th century such as the American Revolutionary War which had a great use of muskets and you also kind of see the rise of uniformed British soldiers versus traditional American civilian militia forces another example is the War of Spanish Succession many different countries were involved in this war and they used a variety of weapons and tactics ranging from muskets to pikes and swords and another example of, the, of this is the French Revolution where French military were used to suppress civilians who were revolting against the French government and you kind of really get to see the abuse that the civilians had to deal with in the French forces kind of forcing themselves against them using all these high-powered firearms and muskets and cannons so later on I'm gonna show a picture of the storming of Bastille so right here so as you can see depicted by this engraving there are a lot of cannons, there are a lot of bayonet rifles and dead people and lots of fire and chaos happening as a result of all these new technologically advanced firearms of this era. So moving on to the 19th century. So 19th century, so 1800 to 1899. So this is when we really start to see the Industrial Revolution happen, where there were a lot of cutting-edge sciences and mass production of weapons, and a lot of these new trends started to really take hold because it was a lot easier to transport stuff because of railroads and merchant ships and you name it. So the Civil War played a very big role in the enhancement of 19th century military technology so people started to shift away from the ball shaped bullets and started to go towards like a more conical bullet that eventually evolved into what we have today when a French officer kind of thought of the idea and then created it and it had a much greater ease of efficiency of loading the bullet into the rifle as well as greater accuracy and longer range so because of how effective these new bullets were at creating a more accurate and longer range weapon Enemy forces were then required to change their ta tactics to account for this by creating stuff like trenches and fortifications at long ranges as a means of protecting oneself from long range rifle rounds. So let's see what the Civil War contributed to all this. So a lot of the new technology during the Civil War was only really available to northern forces because they had much greater access to natural resources, factories, railroads, transport, scientists, um, greater alliances with European countries and other developed nations. The southern forces typically didn't really have much access to all these and typically also didn't have the knowledge to even make many of the things that the, Rus or the northern forces were making. So one good quote regarding how much more technologically advanced the Union was over the Confederacy was a Union soldier wrote once that the Confederate soldiers thought that we had guns that we load up on Sunday and shoot all the rest of the week in regards to repeater rifles or rifles that were able to hold more than one round at a time so they could sometimes shoot as many as seven rounds within a 30 second period using a repeater so a repeater is a type of rifle that uses a manual movement of a bottom portion of the gun to manually load a new round into the gun which then kinda set the foothold for semi-automatic and automatic rifles later on to the 20th century so there was also developments in both the air and sea travel and transport where the Union would use 
um, lighter than air balloons, typically hydrogen balloons, as a way of floating over Confederate camps and spying on them and stuff like that. And there was also a lot of use of ironclad warships, that, such as a Union blockade. And the Confederate forces would use submarines, which at the time were just very basic, like, underwater iron tubes that were able to move it around with weapons on them as a way to really ship sink these ships. Um, the North had a great advantage with railroads and locomotives. They had much greater access to the factories that made these railroads and locomotives as well as access to thousands of more miles of railroad that allowed them to transport soldiers and supplies. Also, the North had a big advantage in military communication, so during the 19th century, you kind of see a rise of um, telegraph to be used as a way of communicating across a large distance. And the first president to use this was President Abraham Lincoln, and he was the first to be able to utilize a telegraph to communicate with officers who are currently on the battlefield. It was very groundbreaking at the time, because typically you would have to go and physically tell people like what your tactics are, what's happening in real time. You would never heal, hear about something until far after it happened. So, moving on to the 20th century. So the 20th century easily had the greatest advances in military technology of any of the centuries we're talking about right now. So, many wars fought post-Industrial Revolution follow groundbreaking scientific discoveries that advanced warfare to an extremely dangerous degree. So some examples of this are airplanes and aircrafts, ground vehicle mobility such as tanks and Humvees and other infantry vehicles, biological warfare where people weaponized biological bacteria and viruses as a way of killing or harming an enemy or an enemy's resources, chemical warfare where they similarly did the same thing with chemicals such as mustard gas, chlorine gas, or other dangerous nerve agents or choking agents that would be very harmful to be exposed to. And, of course, nuclear warfare, advances in theoretical physics and nuclear chemistry gave access to some of the most powerful weapons that are still the most powerful weapons on the planet up to today, capable of destroying life as we know it, have them fall into the wrong hands, or if there's ever a full-scale nuclear war, as well as also advances in long-range missiles and explosive projectiles capable of striking thousands of miles away to any desired target that can use stuff like GPS or you know, whatever it needs to be able to target something that's very far away, and typically can be unmanned. Another important change during the 20th century was the use of automatic firearms and portable missile launchers, ex portable explosive artilleries and mortars, and stuff like that. Also, there are a lot of communication improvements, such as telephones, easy means of exchanging text over large distances, etc., so you can talk to people who are overseas, so, let's, first thing we're going to talk about is airplanes, because that's one of the primary highlights of the 20th century. So, airplanes kind of started in a basic way in the early 1900s. So, in 1903, they the first airplane was really taking, taken off in 1903, and ha has advanced ever since. So, World War One was the first war to really weaponize airplanes. You saw dogfights with very basic, you know, open airplanes with just a couple of machine guns on them. And they would have dogfights in the air, and they would attack ground troops, you name it. In World War II, they made even more advances with aerial bombings and planes capable of carrying bombs that can bomb large areas, such as Pearl Harbor when Japan bombed an American naval base in Hawaii, as well as the Germans bombing Lenden during World War II, and of course the United States dropping the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. So, in the period of 1946-1949, the U.S. made the Air Force its own division, following all these advances in aerial technology. So, that put a lot of money and funding into research that really kind of boosted the, I guess, the limits to what humans could do in an aircraft, and kind of pushed the limits to how high we could go, how fast we can go, how accurate, accurate we can be at insane speeds, how stealthy we can be, stuff like that. Um, as you get into like the 60s and 70s, you kind of get into the really large aircrafts that would be used to kind of transfer soldiers overseas and stuff like that, such as those used in Vietnam and the Korean Wars, which were a few proxy wars that America fought to try to fight the spread of communism from the Soviet Russia. So 
So late into the 20th century, you saw massive advancements in aircraft speed and stealth. You saw fighter jets capable of breaking the sound barrier by going so fast while still being able to accurately attack an enemy because of many, many technological advancements that were on the planes. And of course, the American Air Force kind of led the world as far as how cutting edge our technology was and creating the most deadly and strongest and accurate and tactical fighting jets in the entire world. Also, of course, GPS became an easily accessed resource and assisted a lot of aircrafts in movement and tracking and, I guess, unmanned missions and stuff like that. And, of course, towards the end of the century, you saw unmanned aircraft, such as drones, started to kind of take hold. So here are some pictures of a few aircrafts. So the description really says it all. It's just over the over like an 80-year period, starting from World War One to 1980, to kind of show just how much military aircrafts have advanced in just until 1980. So now we're going to talk about biological and chemical weapons. So these are, like I said, weaponized forms of conventional poisons as well as deadly bacteria and viruses used as a means of killing an enemy or killing many of their resources such as damaging their livestock, their crops, or enacting a plague among their people, you name it. So some examples of these used during the 20th century is anthrax, Marburg virus, telaremia, cholera, salmonella. Those are all biological weapons that were used. And if you read next to them, I put a brief description of exactly what these were and who used them during the 20th century. And, of course, chemical weapons. So there are a few classifications of chemical weapons, such as nerve agents, which were designed to attack the central nervous system. They had a very low LD50, which basically meant it didn't take much to kill somebody with them. Yeah, and LD50 really means like what dosage it takes to kill 50% of people. And there were also mustard gases, which were sulfur and nitrogen-based agents whose purpose is to corrode and burn the skin, eyes, and lungs. So it, it would give people these nasty burns that looked like acid and corrosion burns on their skin and their eyes. And then there were cyanides, which would attack the way the body metabolized stuff and regulated oxygen levels and stuff like that and would kill you down to a cellular level. It would go beyond just, like, killing you normally. And another example of chemical weapons were choking agents, so stuff like chlorine gas, phosgene gas, nitric oxide, etc. They would attack, swell, and flood the lungs with fluid and would cause you to die by lack of oxygen because you can no longer breathe because there is fluid in your lungs or your throat is swelled up and you name it. They were very awful things. And then, of course, you have stuff that we still use today, such as riot control chemicals and tear gases like 2-chloroacetophenone. They are solids that were aerosolized as a means of crowd control that instead of using deadly amounts of stuff, they instead used smaller amounts of stuff that would not permanently damage people, but instead would do enough damage to get them to stop acting a certain way. So here's a photo of two soldiers during World War I using gas masks as a means of avoiding chemical and biological weapons. And then we have automatic weapons, so it's probably another third big highlight of the 20th century. So, it really started to take foothold in the 19th century, so the late 1800s, but it wasn't really as popular until the 20th century when almost any every army involved in the world wars really used them. So, there was a shift towards smokeless gunpowder that allowed to use recoil of these guns to essentially make them chamber a new round and ready themselves for another um, like shot without having to manually have to load them. And it would also use the energy from trapped gases in the barrel to provide the energy to fire a new round, again, without the need for a manual reload in between each shot. And some examples of these are light machine guns, machine guns, and submachine guns. Some of the pictures in the bottom are examples of early to mid 20th century light machine guns and submachine guns. On the left we have a brand light machine gun made by the British in the 1930s, and on the right we have a German MP40, which is a submachine gun which shoots relatively small 9mm rounds at a very high rate of fire, or at least relatively high for that time period. So one big topic we're going to talk about is nuclear warfare. 
So nuclear warfare is obviously deemed as the most dangerous weapon source on the planet. It's only been used twice in history, and that was by the U.S. to end World War II. It, like I said, so powerful and dangerous, it has the ability to destroy the entire planet if a full-scale nuclear war were to ever happen. There's a concept of mutually assured destruction, where if one nation were to attack another nation who also has nuclear capabilities, it would end with the assured destruction of both planets, or both countries, as they would both respond to the attack. So let's go into a brief history of nuclear weapons. So during the early 1900s, a German theoretical physicist discovered the possibility of using atomic fission. Fission is the process of splicing an element into two other smaller elements, and as a result, it releases a massive amount of energy, and this energy can be used as a bomb. And at the time, it was only theoretical until the United States got hold of the intelligence and created the Manhattan Project in 1942. This was a scientific research project intended to develop the first nuclear weapons so that we could stay ahead of the game as far as, the, as, far as this went, since the entire world was currently at war during this period of time. So the United States had their first nuclear weapons testing in the New Mexico desert in 1945. So we dropped a bomb called the Trinity Bomb, equal to 20,000 tons of TNT, in July. So just think about that. In July, we tested our first nuclear bomb, and then in August, we dropped two of them on Japan. So it took only one month for us to go from confidently testing the first bomb to actually dropping bombs in the country to use in the war. So in an effort to... And World War II, the U.S. dropped a uranium and a plutonium bomb on Japan. Casualties were in the hundreds of thousands, at least 100,000 of which happened immediately upon impact of the bombs. It happened over a three-day period, so the first one was on August 6th, the second one was on August 9th. Um, following this, the U.N. pushed for a ban of these nuclear weapons during wartime. I believe it wasn't until way later that they actually had a full-on ban of nuclear weapon use during wartime. Following the United States, the USSR and the UK were next in line to make working nuclear weapons, and I believe it went all the way up until the early 2000s when North Korea was the eighth country in the world to claim to have made a working nuclear weapon. So in the 1950s, the United States made the first hydrogen bomb. So a hydrogen bomb utilizes fusion and fission as a means of producing hundreds of times more powerful explosive force than that of just a fission bomb. And I'm going to go into detail later on about exactly how these bombs work. So the Cold War was a standoff between the U.S. and the USSR. It was a period of time where we seemed to be on a like constant brink of nuclear warfare, and the United States tried to stop the spread of communism throughout Europe, and many proxy wars were fought as a result, and there were a lot of close calls of total nuclear warfare, such as the Cuban Missile Crisis. So how do they work? So first one we're going to talk about is fission bombs. So as you can see by the picture on the side, it's relatively basic, so inside of the warhead there is a charge of TNT, and that explosive force of the TNT will force one chunk of uranium to fit perfectly into another chunk of enriched uranium-235. And this collision, since there's so much force behind the collision, it would then create a fission reaction where this uranium would be um, turned into smaller elements, and that would release so much energy, it would be equivalent to tens of kilotons or tens of thousands of tons of TNT explosive energy. And this can be done with both uranium and plutonium as long as it's a fissionable material. And both of which were dropped on Japan because of how scarce enriched uranium was in the United States during this period of time and why the U.S. pushed towards the invention of plutonium to really find a new outlet for fissionable radioactive material outside of just uranium. And next we have hydrogen bombs. So hydrogen bombs uses the same concept of fission to create a blast powerful enough to cause the fusion of different isotopes of hydrogen, such as deuterium and tritium, to then cause a fusion reaction to happen as a result of the energy from the fission reaction, and it would create heavier elements such as helium, because deuterium and tritium are isotopes of hydrogen, meaning they have more neutrons than that of basic hydrogen, which doesn't have any neutrons. And it would 
create heavier elements, thus releasing so much energy it is equivalent to hundreds of times more powerful than that of a basic plutonium fission bomb. To give you kind of perspective into this, the fusion reaction is what stars are used to power themselves. So, like say the star at the center of our solar system, the sun, uses a fusion reaction with hydrogen to create helium to power itself. And you know the amount of energy that comes out the sun. We feel massive amounts of heat from it from hundreds of millions of miles away. And so that's how fusion bombs work. And like I said, it creates hundreds of times greater force than that of a fission bomb. And it is in the megatons, meaning millions of tons of TNT energy equivalent of explosive force. Um, hydrogen bombs were never actually used in wartime. Luckily, it would have caused much greater destruction. But I believe the reach was so big that in testing hydrogen bombs, the United States actually affected some like uh, Japanese merchant ships. So here are some short videos showing examples of different um, nuclear testing that happened in the United States. So, even though those videos are brief, they were actually very recently released by the U.S. government. They are all over YouTube if you're ever interested in watching them. It's very easy to find. You can just search U.S. nuclear weapons testing, and there are tons of them. I believe they released over 200 of them, and that was just three of them. And it was, it's all very interesting to watch. It kind of gives you perspective of the scale of these weapons and just how big they are because these videos were filmed hundreds of miles away from them to really kind of catch the devastation of them. So, in conclusion, military technology has changed beyond recognition in the last 400 years. It is easily measured that some of the most extreme changes happened in just the last you know, 150 years, so the 20th century, when there was a rise of automatic weapons, aircraft wars, whole new navies, um, armored high-speed infantry vehicles, you know, you have tanks that can go almost 70 miles per hour while accurately targeting an enemy and shooting a missile at it, um, portable command centers, aircraft carriers, ability to mobilize an entire massive army, at the ease of just one ship across the, the globe, stuff like that. That was never really a possibility prior to the 20th century. And in summary, very early ages of military technology during the 1600s utilized very bare versions of what we have nowadays, such as flintlock and wheel lock rifles and pistols and muskets and stuff like that that take took a very long time to load and they had very poor accuracy, very short range, and would often require the soldier using them to be armed with more than just the rifle because of how ineffective they were at a short range. And the last thing we talk about is just how, again, how devastating nuclear warfare is. It is the most cutting edge and dangerous form of warfare that our world has ever seen. If we ever were to fall into a full-scale nuclear war, it would be devastating to the entire world. So here is the work cited for the project. Thank you.